I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in my own Nicaragua. Today I'm going to explain what we mean when so many of us who live abroad say that we only get about 30 days going back to the United States. Now, for those of you who are not Americans, this may just be a point of interest, but it is worth understanding because this affects so many people who live around the world. If you're an American and you're living abroad, either this is going to apply to you and you're going to know exactly what it is, or you should be making decisions about whether or not this is going to apply to you. But I say it quite often, and so many people are just shocked by the way that the United States works, and this is not a bad thing, it's just a thing that most people don't think about. So we're going to explain what we mean by the 30-day U.S. rule so that you can understand why our lives are like this and why we have to make the decisions that we do. We're going to get to that right after the bump. All right, before we get too far in, I just wanna say the 30 days that we talk about is actually closer to 35. We say 30 because you don't wanna push things to the very, very last second. You wanna leave yourself a little bit of buffer room and it does vary from year to year. And there are some uh, parts of the rules that get a little bit complex and it can it just, it's worth saying 30. Trust me on that. You'd rather err on the side of safety. But what do we mean? What are we talking about? Now, for those who are not aware, the United States has a tax regime that taxes you no matter where you live in the world, no matter matter what you do. As an American, there's no such thing as moving abroad. There's no such thing as becoming a citizen somewhere else or anything of the sort and getting away from tax requirements in the United States. Now, there are straightforward tax rules or that may be pushing the point straightforward is not necessarily the way to describe it, but there are tax rules that are well known that apply to you all the time. And as long as you're following those, you know, you will get discounts for certain things. If you have kids or if you're not in the States, a certain amount, there are ways to get discounts, but that you have to file your taxes and pay your taxes. Those are never going to change unless you actually manage to renounce your American citizenship. And the ability to renounce is actually based on paying an exit tax, which can be extremely large. So even if you're leaving completely and giving up your passport, giving up your citizenship, which basically no one does, that's an, a really extreme thing, which isn't even always an option because the United States doesn't have to recognize that. As long as they decide you can't leave, you can't. Um, Outside of that, you are always going to pay regular annual U.S. taxes. If you leave, you pay a one-time giant tax. If you remain, you pay annual taxes. Literally no exception to this. And most people around the world are completely shocked to find out that this is how it works. But it's not quite as bad as it sounds. It is annoying. There's no way around it that you have to file taxes for a country you may have never even entered because there are many Americans who've never seen the United States in person. Maybe many is not the case, but it is a thing. Uh, or people who are small children when they left, they don't know they have citizenship. All these people qualify and technically owe taxes under US law uh, for their entire lives. And this, this really surprises people and it, it can seem pretty non-intuitive. And it's important to remember for those of us who live abroad that we're constantly dealing with how are we going to pay? How are we going to be responsible for whatever our US taxes? It's something we have to think about and deal with on a regular basis. So it's one of the reasons why we especially really want more straightforward tax laws because everything's so complicated when you're not in the country and you don't have access to loads of accountants who can explain these things because they change every year and and so forth now like I said, there are standard discounts. So if you're an American and you're living abroad, you might qualify for what's known as a foreign earned income uh, credit. With that, your income that is earned while you are abroad. I'm not gonna go into all the details. I've done videos that explain who this, who qualifies for this, but basically everything that people are going to tell you is wrong. The um, number of myths around this uh, tax rule are so strong and ubiquitous, even most tax professionals don't have the first inkling of how this works, but it's actually pretty straightforward. It is based on where you exist. It does not have anything to do with your job. I said where you exist. Immediately, everyone's going to go to, well, but the job I have is in... I didn't say it had anything to do with your job. I said one thing it has to do with where you exist, and the second thing, for how long. That is it. Literally, that's it. And it's really hard to meet this rule, but those are the only actual qualifications. Technically, there are a few alternative methods for qualifying for this, and they may include other things, but we're not talking about those. So you talk to your tax consultants and you know find these things out, but be aware, the average, the average tax consultant will get this completely wrong. You need to pull the IRS uh, rules on this and read them yourself. They're very straightforward, believe it or not. 
that the IRS rules for this are super straightforward. They're not hiding anything. They're not obfuscating anything. They're not making it difficult for you at all. But for some reason, because it's so uncommon, tax professionals are working off the myths the same as everyone else much of the time. And so you just need to kind of take this under your own uh, observation and make sure that you're doing what needs to be done and pushing your tax professional uh, to honor the correct thing. And then you should have no problem. But if you're going to do this, the, the rule that applies to most people, especially the people who are potentially on my channel, who are doing the things that we're talking about, what happens is if you live abroad, essentially full time, this is the physical test for or physical presence test for whether or not you are physically present in the United States. And basically they say you need to be in another country for 335 days of their 330 days of the year another country has to be able to claim you. And so in my example case of myself, Nicaragua is that country, but it could be anywhere. If I travel to Honduras for a week or a day or a year, it doesn't matter. Honduras can claim me for those days. Can't. It does claim me for those days. My passport shows that I am claimed as being in Honduras as opposed to being in Nicaragua. It doesn't matter. I can mix and match those. I can travel to Spain. I can travel to South Africa. I can travel to Thailand. It doesn't matter there is a country that's claiming me. If I'm in international waters, a country cannot claim me. Or if I'm in the United States, I'm under the United States. Basically, the U.S. gives you 35 days, 36 on leap years, in which you can be in the United States and or international waters or some other location that is not claimed. Like if you were on the moon or traveling in the International Space Station, those days would count against you. It would be the same as being in the United States. You have to have a jurisdiction that actively has your presence on a day in order for it to... Uh, not qualifies one of your days in the U.S. We say in the U.S., but it, it, there's these extra uh, situations as well, but they, they're not very significant, right? For most people, it's actually time in the United States that affects you. Now, you say 30 days. You say that's a month. That seems like a bit of time, but it is not. Uh, considering you have to travel to, assuming you're going to go visit the United States, you have to travel to the United States. That's going to take at least a day. You're going to travel back from the United States. That's going to take at least a day. You're going to have the time you want to spend there. That's about four weeks. You can go through 30 days really quickly, when, especially if you're going to do more than one visit in a year. So many people who are living abroad but are Americans will simply opt to ignore the foreign earned income rule, either because they have no income to be taxed, so who cares, or they know they're going to be in the United States so much, whether for work or to visit family or to do whatever, that they're going to simply ignore the rule and give up on it. So they may spend half their year in the United States. And that's fine. They're just going to pay taxes as usual for those people. They just go about as if nothing had changed. And that's absolutely okay, but it overlooks a really major potential financial advantage for you if you're able to take advantage of the foreign to earn tax credit. For those of us who are living full-time outside the United States, the United States essentially waives your, your taxable income for the first $120,000. That's this year. It changes from year to year. $120,000 a year is not taxable. So if you earn $120,000 per year or less as a salary, you don't pay taxes on that. There are a few taxes. This is important. There's a few taxes in the United States that you pay regardless of your income. They're very small, but they never go away. Those would always have to be paid. There is no exception to paying those. And you always must file your taxes. Even if you're within the number where you don't have to pay any taxes, you still must file your taxes to say you don't owe anything because that's how the U.S. works. And that's fine. It's just a bit of paperwork that you're all on the same page. Why they don't know this, I don't know, but they don't. Well, they do, but they, they make you file this paperwork anyway. So as long as you're under that limit, for all intents and purposes, you are tax free. This is another reason why we say it's good to have your jurisdiction in the United States be a state that doesn't have state income taxes, because once you do this, you could end up with no income tax whatsoever. Now, it does take a little time to establish this. So if you're moving abroad, it doesn't normally impact you in the first day or even your first several months. You need to go for an amount of time and establish that you are living outside the country. And at that point, it kicks in that you don't have to pay taxes. So it takes a bit of effort. It takes a bit of planning in most cases. But if you put in a little bit of effort, you think about it, you can easily make this part of your income plan and dramatically lower the amount of money that you that you have to pay in taxes. And taxes go out from your from your cash reserves, right? They hit you hard. It's not like an expense where you can write it off and at least get the taxes. Like it doesn't have those advantages, right? So if you're losing X amount of dollars in taxes, you simply lose that amount of spending power period. Uh, so anything that you can do to save on taxes helps you more than most things. There's just no way to work around it. 
So if you earn above 120,000, let's say you earn $150,000 per year, and this is per person. So a married couple each can file this on their own for 120,000 and 120,000 for a total of 240,000 as a married couple. So for 150,000, you would simply take your 120,000, remove that, and then you would file as if you're paying taxes on $30,000 a year. You don't do this in a vacuum, it's all in the paperwork, right? You fill out your federal paperwork as normal, you just take these deductions, and so you're paying this very small amount of taxes, you're only being taxed as if you're making $30,000 a year instead of $150,000 a year. So you, as you earn more money, you'll pay a little bit more in taxes, but you'll never pay taxes on that first $120,000. That's always going to be tax-free. For those who don't live in the United States, the taxes on $120,000 are pretty high. It's going to depend on your situation, but at a minimum, they're probably around $20,000 a year. And at a maximum, they could be well above $60,000 a year. When I was working on Wall Street, we were well into the 52 to 55% tax rate uh, on our overall income tax. So it's easy to get up there. I mean, that was an extreme example, but that was my own example. That's how much my tax rate was in the United States. So even if you're looking at just 25% of your income, that's still $30,000 if you're making $120,000 that you will have in cash in your hand instead of paying it in taxes. That's incredibly significant. And sure, if you earn a lot less, the amount of taxes that you would have to pay on that is a lot less, but the less you earn, the more impactful any taxes you do pay are. If you're only making $30,000 a year, even paying just a tiny bit of taxes will hit you pretty hard. Whereas if you're making 120,000, you have a lot more to play with. Hopefully that makes sense. So it's really important if you have this ability to get this tax credit as an American and not have to pay that. But it really limits you on how much time you can spend in the United States. And this is a really important thing. You do not get taxed on like a per day basis. A lot of people think it must be like this. And even when you explain it, they tend to feel like it's like this, but it's not. Either you get this tax credit or you do not. There is no halfway. There's no partial. There's no prorating. So in a year where you're going to qualify for this, you will qualify for it 100%. If you manage to stay with only going to the United States between 30 and 35 days maximum a year, again, you have to make sure you're counting it just right. Don't get it wrong. As long as you're under that number, you don't have to pay this taxes on your first 120000 If you go over by a single day, you suddenly owe all of the taxes that you would have paid that year on that up to $120,000. Above that, you would have paid anyway. So that number, somewhere between like twenty dollars and $60,000, will be how much money you owe for that one day of staying over. So what does this mean? This means when people say to me all the time, I get this constantly, oh, you're in the United States, you should come visit me, we should go do this thing, we should go do whatever. I really appreciate all the people who want me to come see them in the United States. That would be fantastic. I would love to go visit lots more people. I have lots of family, lots of friends in the United States I'd like to go spend time with. However, as someone who lives abroad and someone who has put in a lot of effort qualifying for this tax credit, and because for a lot of us who live abroad, we do a lot to either have different lifestyles, we do a lot to be able to work certain types of jobs, often our ability to afford living abroad is based on the cost of living being lower and not having to pay our taxes in a country that we're not living in. We have expenses here in country that we have to pay. They may not be as high as in the US, but we pay taxes on things and we pay cost of things. We have to pay for flights, we have to pay for uh, international housing, we have to pay for uh, lawyers to handle things for us because we're not used to the market. There's things that we have overhead for. Again, it's just it's unlikely to be anywhere near as much as the taxes you're saving, so we have a big benefit from this. But this represents a massive amount of our incomes that we would potentially lose should we go over that certain number of days, and our lives are normally gauged around it. This is money we're earning by not having as many employment options. We certainly just can't go around the corner and grab a job. We're not allowed to work in Nicaragua. And even if we could, we couldn't get a job that would pay enough to even end up paying any taxes. So we are very limited, and we're stuck working online or working for ourselves or whatever, or in some cases just not working, but hopefully having some form of income. So that tax credit is really, really important to us. And we're not using those resources in the United States. There's a reason why the United States gives us this discount, because we're not using those roads. We're not using the emergency health care. We're not using the police services. We're not using education services. There's all these things that we're not getting the use out of that that amount of our taxes is supposed to be paying for. So it's not a tax credit that we're like sneakily getting or anything of the sort. We are not using those resources. And so we are not being unfairly taxed for having used them. If we stay any longer than our 35 days, 
we will be taxed for them. So if, when we do that planning, when someone says, oh, why don't you stay a few extra days? You have to understand every moment that I'm in the United States, I am there to see my family or deal with some legal thing that I have to deal with. For example, I need to go get my driver's license renewed and that's going to take a couple days in Houston. I can't get around it. I can't, I couldn't have predicted it very easily. I had no idea that I needed to do that this year or I would have scheduled it uh, in a better way. And every so often things like this come up. You never know when you have to come up and sign some paperwork or whatever. And those surprise days, you have to have buffer built in for those days or you could be at really great risk of mass, massive financial damage because you over uh, or, or under accommodated the number of days you were going to need for things. So every day that I have in the United States is there either for me to deal with something I have to deal with or to visit my family who cannot travel. That is the only reason I'm in the United States. I don't have enough days in my allotted days to be able to spend in the United States to see who I need to see and spend time with my family, like my father, who can't come down to Nicaragua. So I have to go to New York to visit him, and I have to use those days to do so. So while I would love to go visit people, I'd love to go on road trips. There's all kinds of things I'd like to do in the United States. I'd love to go to the Ithaca area wine country and go wine touring again. I'd love to go to Niagara Falls and see the falls. I'd love to do road trips across the country. There's all kinds of things that I'd love to do. I'd love to do lots of vlogs of seeing the country, showing places that I used to live. I have a lot of interesting areas. I grew up in the U.S. I lived all over for my job. And, and traditionally, I drive all over the U.S. And I have friends from other places who would love to go to the U.S. and have me be their tour guide and show them around. But I can't do those things because I would have to choose either not seeing my family, who I get to see very little as it is, or I would have to take this unbelievable tax penalty, which is the same as basically going to someone and saying, hey, do you want to hang out in the United States a little bit? I realize it'll cut your salary in half, but that's not a big deal, is it? Of course it is. Imagine if you made $120,000 a year and suddenly had to only make $80,000 a year or less. And that was your penalty for taking an extra couple days vacation. At a normal job, if you take an extra couple days vacation, you can work it out normally, where either they don't let you, period, you're just not allowed to do it, or they're like, okay, this goes over your allotted amount, but we're going to allow you to buy those days by just not being paid for that day. Okay, no problem. If the United States had a prorating system and I could take a couple extra days, oh, you know what? I pushed it. I went to 40 days. I'm going to take five days in which I'm going to pay the taxes on those days. Sure. Yeah, then it would be the soft thing. And yeah, from time to time, I would do that. I'd take some risks with it. That is not what is happening. It is all or nothing. And so just having that one, well, I just want to hang out with these friends this one extra day. Anyone who has the ability to come visit us in Nicaragua, we depend on that because it is, the, it is really cheap. It is actually, in many cases, so cheap to come visit us in Nicaragua that an American who's coming to visit us may actually save money by doing so. Now, of course, if you come down for like one weekend, you're flying down, you're not going to save money because the cost of the flights is not going to be offset by anything else. But especially for like family and friends who are coming down and staying with us, because we have space to stay in, right? If they're coming down and staying with us, they're staying for free. Their food is super cheap or free. And the cost of getting here is only like $100 each way per person, of course. So if you think about how much you're going to spend on food in a weekend in the United States, hey, instead of spending that on food, just put it into a plane ticket, come down, and you can can basically break even if you're staying for several days down here. So our friends and family from the United States are able to come see us without any penalties and maybe even save money. In reality, they're probably going to spend a little bit extra, but it's going to be minimal. They're going to basically lose no money and just they get a free vacation out of the whole thing. It's really pretty amazing. If I had friends who lived places and had places for me to stay and I could go there and it would cost me so much less than what it costs to just stay at home and all I had to do was play, pay for plane tickets that were basically paid for by the lower cost of, of living, even if I had to pay a little bit, I would be there just like that all the time. It would be amazing. I don't have very many friends where those things come together, where they can put me up, where I have a place to go, where they can, you know, the cost of living is actually lower than where I live. So I can't really do that. But when I was living abroad, when I would go to Europe, we actually would save money by living abroad. Like it really did work, even when we were keeping a life in the United States and still paying our taxes. So our friends and family who are able to come visit us can do so at basically no effort. And so we kind of depend on them doing that because it's really easy in one direction. For us to go to the United States, we have to pay the same tickets that they have to pay to come down here. But we also have to then suddenly pay for our food at very high cost. And that hits us hard. We've worked to make our lives cheaper and people can take advantage of that when visiting us. We lose that advantage when we go visit someone else. And we have very limited time because we're forced into this, this tax system. So we don't have those options. If we have friends in other countries, we can go visit them unlimited. Canada, Mexico, Argentina, Spain. Spain, it doesn't matter. Any of those places, we can go as much as we want the whole year if we want, no problem at all. 
They may be a little bit more expensive, a little bit cheaper, but it's just these little tiny amounts. It's, it's not a big deal. And so we depend on those who can travel coming to see us, right? We're safer than the U.S. We're freer than the U.S. We're healthier food than the U.S. There's no real downsides. Of course, anytime you're going traveling somewhere that you're not going there because you want to travel, yeah, there's some effort involved. I understand. But there's no reasons to be avoiding coming to where we are, right? Going back home to the United States, I understand. It's where we grew up. It's where our friends are from. If we could do it with no particular penalties, of course we would, even though it's more expensive, even though it's a little bit more dangerous. Like those things are things we would generally overlook. But given that the potential penalty is so great, either not spending time with family or having to pay this unbelievable tax burden in order to do so, it's just not realistic. So that is why so many of my friends say all the time, and every single time I say, you know, I only get 30 days. I have to see my dad and my, and my extended family with that time. That is the only thing I can use that time for other than the absolute necessary logistics, like renewing my license or, or signing documents or whatever. And people are so shocked, have no idea that such a thing exists. And it, it, so you have to explain this every time. So that's why I'm making this video. One, I think it's a point of interest. And anyone who's looking at moving, you need to understand these things. Anyone who isn't moving or is doing this part time, I think this is important to be able to see and understand people that you know who have moved. They may be paying their bills based on this factor. And there's no way they're going to be able to work around it, but there needs to be some empathy for why we're in this situation. Yes, we get huge financial advantages out of it. You could do so too. No one is barred from doing so, but we have to stay dedicated to it. And if we do it, if we break that, if we go back and trigger that tax, we then have to go through a very long process of reestablishing that we're outside of the country again. So it isn't like, oh, we pay it, but we just fix it right again immediately. It doesn't work that way either. It takes time to reestablish that. Not as long as if you move to Puerto Rico, that's like a three-year lead time. That one's super extreme if you've ever heard about that uh, particular tax situation that a lot of people desire. It's not as good as it sounds, but it's really hard to get and super limiting. We're not nearly as limited as that, but it's similar. So even without leaving the United States, there are systems like this in different jurisdictions inside the U.S., so it's well worth looking into that if that's something that you find interesting or you're wondering how these different things work. But that's why so often I'm explaining to people, no, I don't have the time in the U.S., and they're like, you're banned from the U.S.? And I'm like, no, I'm not banned, but the penalties that I have to pay, and it's weird because people who are paying those penalties already don't think of them as penalties. They just think of it as a high tax burden. But we get that tax removed by not being in the United States more than a certain number of, year, of days per year. That's the agreement we make with the United States. Everyone's happy. It works out. You know, it's how it's supposed to work. But this is just one of those limitations that people need to understand when working with people like us who are in this situation. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. As always, get down in the comments. Ask your questions about this and other things. Where do you find out about this? Whatever. Um, make videos of yourself that I can put into the show and respond to you with those videos. That would be fantastic. I love doing that. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Help me get closer and closer to uh, someday having to worry about paying taxes again. That would be the kind of problem I'd like to have. No, we're close to that now. Don't need to be because we live in Nicaragua and life is so much more affordable. But if we had to pay U.S. taxes, suddenly it's a lot less affordable than before. Share on social media. Tell a friend about the show. I'll see all of you tomorrow. And one last little favor, if you could click on one of these videos that pops up on the screen, that'd be fantastic. It tells the algorithm to promote the show a little bit more.